highlight. This is a very special day, but even among the special day that we have together, there are highlights as we have today and we will have with a keynote tomorrow. But the keynote speaker today, uh, if you know anything about asbestos, if the world knows anything about asbestos, it's because of this man. Paul Brodeur for many, many years was a staff writer at New Yorker magazine. Uh, he was the one uh, to the world, uh, outside the world of science, that put information out there about the hazards of asbestos. Uh, the series that he had back in uh, uh, the late 60s, or early 70s, he can share with us the exact dates, uh, a series in the New Yorker called The Magic Mineral. Uh, Paul uh, and I, as I found out last night in speaking with him, shared some interesting dates together. We both met Dr. Solikoff for the first time in 1968. He, a few months before I, I met him uh, as a first year medical student uh, at that institution. But Paul took that information and let the world know about these hazards. He also, after that, had a distinguished career writing about other occupational and environmental hazards, uh, uh, non-ionizing radiation issues, uh, continued to write about asbestos, and it is with great pleasure and a great honor for me to be able to introduce to you as our keynote speaker today, Mr. Paul Brodeur. everybody. I warned Linda when she asked me to do this that I've been retired from the New Yorker for 20 years, except for uh, writing a, uh, an answer to that knucklehead uh, correspondent in the New York Times, Joe Nocera, who a year ago claimed in a column that uh, it was ridiculous to think that you, anybody could get asbestos disease from uh, uh, exposure to a worker's clothing. Uh, imagine the Times running such a thing. Well, you know, during the whole uh, asbestos litigation, 10 years during the 1970s, the Times never once wrote about asbestos, just kept saying it, the alleged carcinogen, as if asbestos had constitutional rights. <laughs> oh, I told Linda I'd wander, because as an older time guy, uh, I've been retired for a long time. I haven't really written about asbestos for 30 years. I did write four books. I have a theory about life. It's a series of collisions. You come to a conference like this, you meet new people, nice people. You might meet your boyfriend in a bar or your girlfriend in a Bible reading class. Life is one big, endless bump mobile. And uh, so this is by way of telling you that 50 years ago, give or take a year, I found myself down at City Hall in Manhattan, New York. Uh, I was a journalist for the New Yorker magazine looking for a story. And I was down there researching the health research group, which was a group of uh, designed and uh, formed by Mayor Robert Wagner to keep medical scientists uh, in New York City by giving them grants to study their specialties. There was a brain drain going on, and other cities and other and universities and institutions were hiring medical scientists out of New York, and Wagner wanted to keep them there. So the health research group uh, had its list of grants that it was giving, and they were alphabetical. So the first one was arsenic. What comes after arsenic? Asbestos. Oh, I remembered asbestos. I'd never heard of it. But 30 years before, when I was a kid, 
probably around the time of the first, second world war, uh, we used to go to the films, us 10-year-old brats. And uh, I grew up in a suburb of Boston, Arlington. We used to go to the Regent Theater. My mother didn't like me going there. She thought the films were gangster films, but of course that's where we went, because that's where we wanted to see. Anyway, we all went there on Saturday for 10 or 15 cents, and the theater curtain on the proscenium curtains had large block letters that read asbestos. We had no idea what it meant. Nobody else did either, for that matter. But we used to get up and chant at just before the movie began and the curtain was lifted. It was, of course, the fireproof curtain. Uh, all schoolboys eat stewed tomatoes on Saturday. Boy, what in innocent days. Imagine what kids would chant today. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was my first knowledge about asbestos. It wasn't any knowledge until I came across as asbestos in this um, health research group. And that was uh, the first bump on the bump mobile. And the second was that Irving Selikoff a scientific outfit was at Mount Sinai Hospital, and it just so happened that I was married and raising a fledgling family three blocks away on the Upper East Side 96th Street. So that's how I got together with Irving Selikoff. And uh, we had, he hit it off, we hit it off right from the beginning, but he realized, of course, that I knew nothing about asbestos. So he handed me, I think it was, you know, Barry, was it 632 pages or 832? It was a huge monograph that thick of an asbestos conference that he held at the Waldorf Astoria in New York three years before. And I read it from cover to cover and understood maybe half of it and didn't understand half of it, but he soon explained to me the ins and outs of epidemiology. Uh, some of the, there, were, uh, there was one story in, in that monograph that I never forgot and never will. It was told by a South African doctor, chess physician named W.H.R. Skeepers. He later became the health commissioner here in Washington, D.C. He told of white overseers with whips forcing young Bantu children in the Amosite asbestos mines of South Africa to stand in huge jute bags as raw asbestos was poured over their heads and were made to tromp it down. And he said that none of those children probably lived to be 10, 12 years old. They didn't even live long enough to develop asbestosis, scarring of the lungs. They probably died of right-sided heart failure, core pulmonale. That stuck with me forever. So I went to my editor, William Sean. He was a legendary editor of The New Yorker. I was very lucky to work there. I don't think the asbestos pieces would have been published had I not worked there. Sean was not only a legendary editor, he was, he was the man totally responsible for uh, uh, making the, uh, an entire issue of the New Yorker available for John Hersey's seminal piece, Hiroshima, in 1946. You know, after we dropped that bomb in 1945, there was, there was almost nothing published for the public in this country about the effects of that bomb on the civilian population. And Sean sent John Hersey to Hiroshima to write about it. And that was the very first piece. Then uh, Sean also published during the 1950s a series of pieces that talked about uh, various chemical spills and various insults to the environment and they were uh, run by, 
more or less under the aegis of E.B. White, who wrote a little essay every, uh, every week when they appeared called These Precious Days. A few years after that, Sean published what is probably, certainly, surely, the greatest environmental piece of all time uh, in its entirety, Rachel Carson's famous Silent Spring. So I was lucky to work at a magazine that had this tradition of running, of being concerned about the environment and about the public health. So Sean was very glad to, and quickly gave me uh, permission to uh, research and write a piece about asbestos disease for him. So I went back to Selikoff and uh, got a rudimentary education in what epidemiology meant. Uh, he was very patient with me. I needed a lot of explanation. And then I set out in uh, March of 1968 to write that piece that was called The Magic Mineral. And I'm going to digress here, as I warned you I would, uh, Linda, to tell you a couple of funny things that happened. During the very first trip I made, uh, I came down to Washington. I think it was to see w, Dr. Skeepers, who, as I said, was head of the... Uh, health department here, uh, I wanted to uh, corroborate that story he told about the Bantu children it stuck in my mind. And uh, when I was down here, I made an appointment to see a Navy captain who um, was uh, involved in the asbestos problem. The Navy was, of course, sitting on it, didn't want anything to come out about it. I didn't know that. Uh, he took me to lunch at the Navy Club, which was a very nice place, and he regaled me with uh, how the Navy depended upon asbestos in all of its ships, boiler rooms, uh, in the, particularly in its nuclear submarines. And uh, then at the end of the lunch, he said something that I would hear again. He said, just remember, when you're working on your asbestos piece, you can get chest disease from digging in your garden. I thought, oh, okay. So I went from there, from Washington, I flew out to Cincinnati to see a man named Louis B. Crawley. Funny how names stick in your head. I can't remember the Navy captain's name for the life of me, but I can remember Louis B. Crawley, who was a scrawny little guy and he was head of the old Bureau of Occupational Safety and Health. He had the unenviable reputation of having, as a, an industrial hygienist, inspected asbestos textile factories all over the southern United States and found incredible levels, dust levels, in every one of those factories and an extraordinary amount of asbestosis in the workers and never said a single word to anybody about it. Not to the unions, not to the workers, not to anybody else. I didn't find that out right away. But while I was interviewing Louis B. Crawley, he said to me, you know, he said, you can get chest disease from digging in your garden. <laughs> Number two. So about two weeks later, I was in uh, New Jersey, I think, if I remember now, it's a long time ago, as I said, it's almost 50 years. I was uh, talking to the former owner of a little mom and pop asbestos textile factory on the Meadowlands. And uh, he was willing to talk to me about some workers that he thought had uh, developed lung disease. But then he piped up, hey, you know, it's not all that bad, you can get chest disease from digging in your garden. Whoa, number three. <laughs> well, you know, I consider myself a man of reasonable intelligence, but you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know that you were running up against a cover-up there, did you? Uh, and of course, that's what there was, a massive cover-up. The companies, the insurance companies, Everybody had known for years and years. Barry Castleman will probably be able to tell you more stories than I can about what they knew and when they knew it. 
When I was writing 50 years ago, the first people I knew about who knew about asbestos in this country were the Prudential Life Insurance people. As early as 1918, give or take a year, that's a century ago, Prudential knew that it was infusing to ins and was recommending to other insurance companies, Canadian and American insurance companies, that they not insure the lives of asbestos workers because of the presumed injurious conditions in the asbestos workplace. 10 years later, in 1928, Travelers and another big asbestos company in a, in a rating uh, conference in Boston also said that they were not insuring the lives of asbestos workers because of the, di the disease. Many years later on a television show, I was asked about what I thought about these insurers and I called them morticians of statistics. One of the, I, I was speaking about a specific company. So the vice president called my editor, William Sean, and demanded that I be fired. Sean was not the kind of man to deny his employees their First Amendment rights, so nothing came of that. Um, but the, I'll go on into this a little later if there's time. Um, the insurance companies bear a huge, huge responsibility for the asbestos tragedy. Uh, it can't be overstated, and they still are fighting it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I uh, wrote this piece about asbestos, and uh, in addition to writing about the school boy chant, all opening up with that, actually, I talked about how the uh, syndicated comic strip Joe and Asbestos appeared in the Baltimore Sun in 1925. Uh, people didn't know anything about asbestos, but they kind of knew that it was fireproof because the stable boy in that comic was named Asbestos. And he was got his fu funny name because, as he said, no, hot, no matter how hot my tips are, they will never burn a hole in your pocketbook. Um, and uh, went on to describe the astonishing physical properties of asbestos how fibrous it was. One million chrysotile fibers can lie side by side in a linear inch. 630 in the diameter of, of a human hair. The longer fibers, it's a, it's a mineral of stone actually, uh, can be woven like uh, flax or wool or cotton. Each of those fibers has the tensile strength of a piano wire, you can only imagine uh, the industrial uses. If I were to start listing the industrial uses, you wouldn't have an afternoon session here, so I'm not going to. Suffice it to say, asbestos had a minimum of 10,000 separate uses in the industrial society. And that finally, uh, uh, there wasn't a Automobile, airplane, train, ship, missile, or engine of any kind that did not contain asbestos in some form or other. And because its tiny fibers were eminently respirable, it also found its way into the lungs of man, whereby remaining as indestructible as it does in nature, it could wreak terrible havoc. The earliest known Disease ramifications of asbestos were written by the Greek geographer Strabo and the Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder around the time of Christ. They both noted separately in writing of a sickness in the lungs of slaves whose occupation it was to weave asbestos into cloth. But the ancients were much too enamored of the magical qualities of asbestos to worry about the lungs of slaves. Because it was indestructible, it means indistinguish, in, inextinguishable in Roman, in Latin, amiant. Uh, it was used as wicks in the candles of the Vestal Virgins because the wicks never burned out 
All you had to do was add oil, and they were forever going to be lighted. It was the funeral dress of kings. Uh, Charlemagne was said to have awed some Germanic tribesmen by throwing an asbestos tablecloth into the fire and withdrawing it unscathed. Uh, Marco Polo encountered the same phenomenon when he took a trip to that famous trip he took to China in 1432 or thereabouts. Uh, his Chinese hosts told him that, uh, he asked them what, what it was made of, and they said, salamander's wool. Well, Marco was too smart for that. He found out there was an asbestos mine out there. But it also was true that in medieval days, uh, salamanders were thought to be totally impervious to flame. And so the old story about salamander's wool had some basis in medieval superstition. And that's why in the logo of every heat and frost insulation and asbestos workers uh, union, you will find a salamander. Sometimes he's sitting on top of open, an open flame. Other times he's sitting on top of a heat pipe. But the salamander became the logo of the heat and frost insulators and asbestos workers. Well, getting back to uh, what happened uh, with the first piece. Uh, it came out in October of 1968, and it I'll say that it, it went pretty viral uh, because I ended it by uh, recounting how I got off a bus coming down Fifth Avenue to my office from Mount Sinai, and there were, in those days, uh, about 15 or 20 major 40-story or, or higher uh, skyscrapers going up. And you'd see these tarpaulins over the girders. Above the tarpaulins, the steel was rust red brown, and below it was covered with gray frosting, which was sprayed asbestos insulation, and half of it was lost into the ambient air. So untold trillions of fibers were floating all over the city, and I wrote about that, and the piece more or less went viral in the country. But it was a happy conjunction of events here. A year after the piece was published in October of 68 and became known through the country during the winter, a year later, a wonderful lawyer in Texas, I believe in Beaumont, uh, Ward Stevenson, uh, filed a case for an insulator named Clarence Burrell. I've had the pleasure of meeting his son uh, and his uh, daughter-in-law uh, yesterday. I was honored to meet them. And I, was on, I never knew Ward Stevenson because he died even before the Burrell case, which he won, was upheld by the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. But um, I want to pay a tribute to uh, Ward Stevenson because he was an unusually fine lawyer. He, he wrote to, he got, he got uh, Irving Selikoff to give the one, and, the, his own, really his only deposition in, in an asbestos insulation trial. And uh, that was in the Burrell trial. And Selikoff then said he'd allow his colleagues at Mount Sinai to give uh, <coughs> uh, depositions at trial, but he knew his time would just be eaten up by it, and he wanted to continue his work, his great work in, as an epidemiologist. But here's what Ward Stevenson wrote to Irving Selikoff in 1969, quote, we lawyers like to feel that by our actions in bringing matters of this nature to trial, we are performing a service and, hopefully, alerting the manufacturers to, need, to the need for an all-out effort to design preventive measures. Well, that was an empty hope, as it turned out. Um, he then added, I too, as I know you are, am touched by these men who come into my office with asbestos disease, who are now too old to learn a new occupation and have no choice but to continue in the trade. 
A few days later, he was speaking to a seminar in Denver, and he said, quote, the victims of asbestos disease cry out for help from members of the bar, which could render a substantial benefit to mankind by alerting the public to the dangers of asbestos insulation. Well, many great lawyers followed uh, in the footsteps of uh, Ward Stevenson, but the combination of uh, Irving Selikoff's great epidemiology, uh, which he did in the middle 60s, uh, the Burrell trial, which Ward Stevenson brought and was upheld and became the law of the land when the Fifth Circuit upheld it in 1971, creating the greatest toxic tort litigation of which up until then in American jurisprudence, and some timely journalism, uh, and, and by the way, a great deal of help and cooperation with Selikoff by the asbestos workers' unions and labor, uh, created a unique combination where the public became informed and the legal profession became informed and the medical profession became energized by the knowledge of asbestos disease. And then, of course, sad to say, the uh, captains of industry uh, closed ranks, didn't do what Ward Stevenson had hoped they would do, were not alerted to take preventive measures, but simply went on and fought tooth, hammer, and nail with their insurers to prevent anybody from getting proper compensation. And then, when they were finally cornered like rats in the last floating part of a sinking ship, they filed for bankruptcy. And when they filed for Chapter 11, that's the final solution when industry gets trapped. It can spin off its costly, libelous libel liabilities into a holding company that is supposed to pay a trust, which of course is with John Banville soon went bust, so people are getting 10 cents on the dollar. And, uh, and the whole thing gets, goes back. And it, this will happen again, because this is the way the private enterprise system in our country is presently set up. This is corporate America. There's a suspicion is not going to be the last major uh, public health hazard by any means. My own estimation is that cell, cell telephone radiation is going to prove to be one very shortly. But whatever, um, this is what happened. And when you say, you know, what did they know and when did they know it? Gosh, I'm coming to the end here. Uh, the, uh, I, wrote, I wrote in my second book, about a couple of men from the old Union Asbestos and Rubber Company. They had workers, they, they, their workers were the first workers that Selikoff studied after he set up his uh, uh, office in Patterson, New Jersey. They came from this old company that had, had uh, left and gone to Texas, Tyler, Texas. I read, later wrote a book about them. Uh, and uh, they all had asbestos, some form of asbestosis on x-ray. But within five years, six of them were dead. And within seven or eight years, seven, 15 out of the 17 were dead. And so Selikoff, of course, asked himself that great question that medical scientists asked, why is this happening? And he soon he found out when he studied the asbestos insulators. Anyway, a couple of men from this plant went to see Vandiver Brown. Vandiver Brown was the chief lawyer and vice president of Johns Manville, the largest asbestos company in the world. In, uh, in, 1930, in the 1950s, they went. And uh, Thomas Callahan, who was the foreman, and Ed Schumann, who was the general manager of the plant, and this is what they said to me. We asked, quote, we asked them if they knew of any way we could improve the dust situation in our factory. My God, they were brutal bastards. Why, 
They practically laughed in our face. They told us that workmen's compensation payments were the same for death as for disability. In effect, they told us to let the men work themselves to death. And later, I heard this same story from another person who was present at that meeting, whose name was Charles Romer, who was a, an attorney in Patterson, New Jersey, for one of those, uh, for the Unarco, the Union Asbestos and Rubber Company. And he went, his version was, we asked them uh, how we, they, they quote, I'm quoting from him, they told us it was foolish of us to be concerned and that if John Manville's workers were told they would stop working and file claims against the, against the company, so it was company policy to let them work until they quit work because of asbestos disease or died as a result of it. Roman remembered that he had said, Mr. Brown, do you mean to tell me you would let them work until they drop dead? And that Vandiver Brown had replied, yes, we save a lot of money that way. What they knew and when they knew it. Now I went on to write uh, books about the cover-up that was called Expendable Americans in the New Yorker. It appeared as a five-part series, which was, I think, the longest series ever published by the magazine. And then finally, a uh, book entitled Outrageous Misconduct, The Asbestos Industry on Trial, which told of the uh, history of the trials, starting with the great Varel case and uh, going on through the trials and the insurers and all that business uh, until the bankruptcy of the early 80s. Um, during my career as a journalist, I've been called an alarmist by the captains of the asbestos industry, a scaremonger by the detergent manufacturers, a muckraker by the makers of chlorofluorocarbon, the chemicals that were destroying the ozone layer, a sensationalist by officials of the electronics industry, and more recently, an environmental terrorist by the electric. <laughs> By the, by the electric utility industry. And people who are more kindly disposed toward my work regard me as an investigative reporter. In frustration, I must confess, I have sometimes thought of myself as some kind of literary entomologist, someone who overturns rocks in the dank garden of the private enterprise system and describes what he sees crawling out from underneath. But the fact is I'm none of the above. I'm simply a writer who <coughs> worked for a magazine during the time in which its editor believed that public health issues should be written about at length and in depth. In closing, I would very much like to pay tribute to your fine organization because it is very important always to keep the human aspect first and foremost, which is something you people do admirably. We, uh, in life, we tend to view statistics as a way of gaining distance on human tragedies. We say so many casualties in this war or that war, so many dead in this battle or that battle, so many souls lost in this airplane crash, so many refugees drowned when the boat capsized in the taking them across the Mediterranean. Uh, but, and so many, you know, dead or estimated uh, people who had their lives shortened by asbestos disease. In the end, I think that probably one of the more important sentences I ever wrote regarding the asbestos tragedy was, quote, statistics are human beings with the tears wiped off. This is what you people, Linda, all of you stand for, 
and uh, I commend you for it. Thank you.